A very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Ankita from NASCOM. Yesterday, we learned about pharma sales kind of experiences one has to go through in order to succeed in selling. Today, we will focus on how to build and scale tech products when all hell breaks loose, a topic very much relevant to the current scenario, very much in sync with the COVID-19 times we all are going through. So let's get started. I have with me Koster Pateka, founder Nitrous Oxide Consulting. Also, he is a big contributor, supports the NASCOM product councils in many of its initiatives like the Skill Dev Pillar, the very own pillar, Deep Tech Club, PCAM, who will share his insights on this subject. Before I hand over to him, two more things from my side. Please ask questions. Costa will cater to most of them, keeping the time limit in mind. Please do not forget to leave your feedback post webinar, which will be a big help to sharpen my future sessions. Welcome, Kostum, and over to you. Okay, thank you, Ankita. Um, and so the introduction. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I know many of us were hoping to have the lockdown end today. Uh, unfortunately, that hasn't quite happened. So in any case, thank you for joining. And uh, I'll, I'll walk you through a series of slides. Uh, kindly uh, hold your questions till the second half or towards the end. And I'd love to answer as many questions as possible. Okay. Okay, uh, so before we get started, oh. I think I'm just going to dwell quickly on the legal disclaimer of NASCOM. And uh, with that, I will uh, just jump into the slides. Uh, I'm going to just spend a minute or so uh, giving a brief overview of my background. Um, so you kind of know where I'm coming from. Uh, because as we go through the session, uh, you will find that a uh, lot of what I'm going to talk about is essentially based on my experience, uh, based on my experience building products, building products in the US, uh, then in India. I've been at it almost 20 plus years now. And a lot of this experience uh, is what I want to bring to bear in terms of the framework that I'm going to design. And uh, like Ankita mentioned, uh, you know, in addition to, of course, working in the US and India, over the last year or two, I've been involved uh, with NASCOM, um, helping various efforts, including recently some of you may have joined uh, PCAM. And uh, a little bit about the company that I run. So I run a, a small product management and strategy consulting company um, called Nitrous Oxide. Uh, we work with uh, product companies and IT services companies. In general, everything to do with building and scaling products across a variety of areas. Been at it now for almost four years, starting in 17, and uh, work with founders, product teams, you know, people looking to build products, accelerators, across uh, you know, a variety of functions. Um, so that being said, uh, I will jump into the presentation now, and we'll go from there. So first, uh, you know, this is uh, the first slide. I think, as all of you know, uh, we are experiencing a crisis of unprecedented proportions, which means, you know, pretty much everything that could have been broken, things that could have gone wrong, is happening, and the crisis seems to be operating on multiple levels. The first thing is, of course, the medical crisis. Uh, you know, uh, people are hurting, uh, people are dying, people are getting sick. Uh, you know, all of that is happening. In addition to that, of course, uh, we have an economic fallout of that because you know, likely the only tool that people have in their hands now is to keep away from each other, which means entire countries and economies, businesses have been shut down to avoid the spread of the virus. And what is even more disconcerting is that this is actually happening all across the world. Right? Pretty much no country, no region, 
no business has been spared. And in that, uh, I think this crisis is humongous. Um, now, of course, all of us have been you know, reading and following about the crisis, so I won't necessarily dwell on the crisis itself. Uh, but what I wanted to call out is that most of us have not seen something like this in our life right? where you have a crisis that is truly global in proportion um, that's turned out to be extremely unpredictable uh, every country every uh, leader is actually continuously adapting uh, the situation is dynamic that means you know in most cases you don't know what's going to happen next uh, you know you had a little taste of that when yesterday the lockdown was extended by another two three weeks in india um, anybody who's forecasting is continuously updating their forecast um, so that's what i think makes it quite challenging so uh, this slide first of sorry I to intervene now... uh, have you changed your slides first of sorry to bother you in between have you changed your slides because we are able to uh, view your first slide the op opening slide are you able to see the slide uh, with the medical economic whole world? Were you able to see? Uh, no. Audience, please write. Are you able to have a look at uh, cost of slides? No, no cost of. Okay, hang on. Uh, okay, in that case, uh, let me share my screen uh, and uh, just a moment. Sure. sure sure yeah i'm just sharing my screen First of all, are you able to have a look at my screen now? Yeah, just a second. I'm going yeah, to connect so I can see what you are showing. Hi, Shreya, are you there? Uh, can you share your screen with us, Shreya? Shreya is my colleague. Um, Shreya, can, are you able to hear us? Hi, Shreya, are you there? Uh, slide uh, just start and, and just speak that now you will be sharing the screen with all of us uh, sorry for the inconvenience all of you uh, my colleague Shreya now will be sharing the screen uh, with Costa and with all of us and uh, now we will begin the presentation in next 20 seconds Ankita? Yeah, yeah, Shreya, we all are there waiting for you. Okay. Uh, uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys see it now? As of now, uh, please, audience, write. Kostrup, can you? Uh, no, I cannot see it. I can't see it. Uh, 
Okay, so I, uh, Ankita, can you do the setting from your side? Um, now, please try because I made constantly present. Now, you please try. I am clicking on start screen sharing. Can you see it now? No, just a moment. Uh, actually, it's showing in my side that Kostub has to share his screen. Ankita, I think you have to make me presenter. Just a moment. I, I have given you the presenter rights. Please go ahead. Yeah, now it's come. Yeah. Can you guys see it yeah. now? So maybe the full screen, uh, full screen, uh, Shreya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing that. Hello. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hi, Kostub. Can you uh, see Shreya's screen now? Yes, I can see it now. Yeah. So it's all perfect. So yeah, we can go ahead now. Uh, Pastor, please let Shreya know that when to uh, change the screen. Okay, sure. Right. Uh, Ankita, earlier, were you not able to see the slide after this at all? Was it stuck on the first screen? Yeah, yeah, it was stuck on the opening slide, Pastor. Okay, uh, never mind. Yeah, go to the next slide, please. Uh, and the next one. Yeah, okay. So I think I'll just dwell on it here for a second. Uh, I was just sharing my background uh, in terms of where I'm coming from and uh, let's go to the next slide okay i think i talked about this slide as well in terms of the crisis essentially being unprecedented and yeah uh, just stay here now okay uh, so it. like i was saying uh, you know uh, this crisis is of unprecedented proportions uh, both in terms of the magnitude in terms of the kind of impact it's having and everybody is uh, trying to figure out uh, as as we go along right? so this is a forecast uh, from you know folks like bloomberg and the chart on the right is from uh, moody's investor service which talks about uh, what is likely to happen and uh, there are various opinions as to what could be the impact of this crisis on the global economy right so two things are clear one is that the impact is humongous right so even these estimates which are about two or three weeks old are now saying the impact is nearly three trillion dollars which is almost the size of the indian economy i have highlighted two uh, forecasts there uh, one is the us which says in year 20 it will contract about two or three uh, percent and the one below in india which says india will likely grow at 2.4 percent and now that we've had an extension of the lockdown i think these forecasts are already being revised downwards right so all in all the overall global economy will contract that means it will be a recession overall economic growth will be less uh, likely countries like China and India will escape that and will show a small amount of growth. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Just one sec. Yes. Again, I think. Can you see that? Uh, no, it is still stuck on the previous slide, this uh, stats yeah, and numbers. Yeah, it's stuck in my system also. One second, let me just minimize and go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, while it's true that the entire uh, economy is affected globally, the impact on every industry will not be there. And I think this is very important to note because what this suggests, uh, this is uh, another Moody's Investor Service report, I think focused primarily on the US where it's categorizing industries into high exposure, uh, moderate exposure, low exposure, et cetera. 
so you know it's a little hard to read but clearly couple of industries are having high exposure certainly lodging and hotels uh, you know any kind of passenger transportation any kind of tourism um, and then of course at the top you are seeing things like apparel and manufacturing uh, auto sales and parts so clearly these are industries which have a high impact and then below that of course there are other industries which have a lower impact uh, tech software and hardware is considered to be an industry which has moderate exposure um, on the other hand on the right you are seeing industries like construction defense packaging pharma food uh, which are expected to have very low exposure and i think this is relevant because as later we'll get into the framework it's important to know uh which industry will be affected and how uh, as far as your customers go go to the next slide please yeah okay thank you so one uh, thing to note about uh, here is the idea that you know often people are saying that hey every crisis creates an opportunity so i want to qualify that statement by pointing out that i see that in general as partially that means yes uh, of course every crisis is creating an opportunity but i don't think it's uniform it's not the same for everyone uh, there will be companies industries sectors which will be net uh, losers in this process uh, certainly airline industry uh, is pretty obvious in that sense because you know world all over the world and within domestic air travel has been shut down uh, it's unclear when it will open up uh what will be the extent to which open up and what kind of restrictions will be imposed when it does happen uh on the other hand certain sectors will have downside and upside that means for instance now you are seeing that certain parts of tech are actually doing well certain parts of retail are doing well groceries and drugs and pharma are doing well uh other parts of it are doing not so well uh you know, certainly nobody is buying apparel and fashion for instance uh there are also industries which will have only a net upside you know, pharma being one of them you know all kinds of cpg goods which are used for cleanliness sanitization medical equipment medical testing uh are expected to have an upside and then of course uh, there are specific sectors in tech uh, which will have a quick impact next slide please next slide please yes doing it cost just one second sure. i think no the slides are heavy uh, so they are sort of hanging my sister one second let me just yeah you can proceed sure so you know this is a quick look at past crises you know i don't think any of them are really comparable in terms of the magnitude but this is sort of one way to look at the different crises right so this is a graphic which shows the stock market i think you are seeing two indi indexes in here one is nifty 50 which is the indian index and the s&p 500 which is a us based index and in that what you are seeing is before some of these catastrophic events or crises uh what happened you know when that crisis started playing out so for instance one of the first crises is around 2000 when the dot com bubble burst right so the stock markets were down nearly 40% and 5 years after that it recovered uh, probably not quite to the same level in fact it uh, you know went up uh, from the bottom but Uh, it it grew about 15 to 17 percent. Uh, similar thing happened after 9/11, the terrorist attacks, uh, which also affected you know of course US in a big way and a lot of impact on other countries as well. I think you had a similar story. And of course this is tracking over five years, so none of this really speaks to all the peaks and valleys in between, all the ups and downs in between. But in a way it says that hey over time things will get better. but and in all likelihood the same will happen with the current crisis which has just started playing out and but you are seeing some countries able to manage that or partial 
improvements on the medical crisis and maybe some amount of economic opening is happening uh, we heard some of that in india today as well with possibly some sectors opening up partially so all of this eventually there will be a recovery but at this moment it's unclear how long that recovery will be uh, how it will play out and you know to what extent we will recover uh, next slide, please, whenever you can share. Doing it. Okay. So Sorry. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, just a slight personal perspective here. Uh, so, I started uh, working in '98 uh, in the US, and uh, as it turned out, in a year or two, a whole series of crises followed. Right? Uh, the dot com bubble burst, 9 uh, 11 happened, and to sort of top it all, uh, the company I worked in. Uh, was penalized for some kind of accounting issues and uh, the stock plunged uh, the company went through a series of layoffs i think it reduced to almost one third in size uh, so you know that was my first experience dealing with not just one crisis but a series of crises right and one of the things that i really took away from it was that you know no, nobody knows right i think it's very tempting to do what others are doing listen to what others are saying because there is so much uncertainty that it's hard to have an objective view of your own uh, it's hard to stay calm it's hard to figure out how to deal with things but by the time those two or three years period was over and i had dealt with all kinds of things in terms of you know uh, sort of scaling up a team uh, as things were going well then scaling it down as things started tumbling uh, then as things got really bad trying to sort of uh, you know, reimagine reposition some of the products that i was building finding net new solutions bite-sized solutions so a lot of uh, tips and tricks i sort of learned through that process in terms of what it takes uh, not just to survive but what it also takes to start figuring out growth in terms of how you could start building uh, better. Okay, go next, please. So, you know, the, the this has been sort of a perspective that's dear to me, uh, which is when things like this happen, when things go haywire, you know, how do you deal with it, right? Uh, so I like this Robert Frost poem. Uh, it says you know I, I took the one less traveled and that has made all the difference uh, versus following the herd so i point this out just to kind of remind you that you know as we get into this crisis as things start you know working or not working things go nuts uh, you know how, how do you want to approach it you know do you want to take the path just because everybody else is taking it or do you want to also Try to figure out what makes sense to you. Okay. Uh, go next slide, please. All right. So, yeah, one of the things, you know, sort of uh, dwelling on the same idea I want to point out is, you know, a lot of copy pasting of solutions will occur. I think a lot of people are saying that one way to recover from this is to follow the China model. You know, what startups are doing in China, what people are, uh, companies are doing in China. Uh, you know, everybody who's an expert you know uh, is has an opinion uh, so do i so don't follow my opinion blindly either but the point is that nobody has all the answers right and not because uh, people don't know but also because every product every company every situation is different uh, and that requires critical thinking and analysis right that means you need to still look at your own company your own product your own customer base and then figure out what works there you know is what is the path to navigate this turn um, and you know that's where we'll spend most of the rest of the session on is uh, talking about that framework okay next slide please uh, so this is just a quick uh, catch on you know uh, what are some of the things that happened uh, 
which were a fallout of the past crises uh, and how that in certain cases led to new use cases new products in some cases entirely new industries um, or in some cases regulations so and it doesn't matter whether the crime crisis is real or perceived uh, for instance the entire y2k if any of you are that old uh, actually led to a boom led to pretty much the creation and expansion of the it services industry and the indian it services industry of course was a great beneficiary of that uh, when the dot com boom happened you know a lot of companies uh, had crazy valuation billions of dollars even the company i work for was valued at 15 20 billion dollar at its peak and uh, when it crashed i think it went to almost 500 million dollars and then recovered over a period uh, it also led to a lot of regulations uh, in terms of accounting you know what is revenue how to recognize it and so on and once the dust settled actually it led to really the second boom of the internet or so called internet 2.0 which actually created companies which changed the way uh, people uh, obtain products and services changed our way of life and of course we are seeing that play out you know for several years since then and it continues to happen uh, something like the terrorist attacks actually created a whole network of data mining surveillance intelligence gathering companies you know uh, armed drones actually came into being uh, you know, people could shoot at things uh, from you know thousands of miles away so all kinds of things happened uh, and of course, uh, similar fallout from the financial crisis, uh, though bulk of it was sort of redistribution of wealth uh, and a lot of regulations, especially in US and Europe and some in India as well. So uh, why I point this out is because, you know, similarly, uh, it's natural to expect that the current series of crises, both the medical one and the economic crisis uh, created through the lockdowns, are actually going to have a similar impact that means there will be opportunities created there will be redistribution of wealth there will be regulation and it's up to each product each company each founder leader each product manager uh, to start figuring out how to deal with this okay next slide please so you know that was sort of the generic high level view what's happening with the economy sort of my perspective on you know what are different positives, upsides, downsides, how people could deal with it. Uh, let's take a just a brief look at what's happening uh, with the tech world. So certain trends are pretty obvious. Uh, you know, remote is in, you know, nobody can meet anybody, travel has stopped. So all kinds of remote things are actually getting a lot of emphasis. Working, learning, buying, medicine, you know, a lot of countries have loosened up their norms and regulation around telehealth around managing of medical information records etc so clearly that's going to create a lot of opportunity uh, for tech players in that space the larger macroeconomic trend given the uncertainty is that some if not all of it budgets will be trimmed uh, or delayed or slowed down but one positive I see in this, especially for the tech industry, you know, anybody in the B2B space, uh, is that often uh, technology will be an enabler uh, for gains in productivity, automation, for making life simpler uh, in this situation where people cannot walk across, cannot meet face to face, cannot actually uh, go and sell uh, face to face. So in all these situations, technology could be an enabler uh, for bridging these gaps, right? Where human beings cannot get together. Then how do you still continue to do business? How do you continue to communicate? How do you continue to work together? Um, so all of that is likely an opportunity uh, for tech businesses who are operating in that space or who figure out how to position their product uh, relevant to the current times. In addition to that, of course, uh, buying priorities will shift. Um, there will also be use cases that will simply disappear. Uh, new ones will appear. Some of those could be short term. Uh, and later when we talk about the framework, I'll dwell on that a little bit more. Uh, why I point this out is because, you know, pretty much everything is changing, right? So barring a few use cases, situations and priorities, everything is shifting because of what's happening. And that is why it's important to uh, take stock of all this. Okay, go next, please. 
So, you know, now that we've spent enough time um, sort of talking about the background, you know, what is happening across the world, what could likely be the impact. Uh, the second half is actually more specific uh, in terms of how to now start making sense of this for your specific product and company. And this is the framework that I've been working on uh, you know, over several years, which of course now I've tuned again, uh, given the current circumstances. Um, so I'll talk about this uh, in terms of, you know, how, how does one start dealing with this? And, you know, this is sort of taking into account a sort of product manager, product mindset, which says, hey, now that I have built a product, I've built a company, what do I need to change? Uh, do I need to change anything? How do I change it? Why do I change it? What are things that are important? What has shifted? So a lot of this uh, is going to be like a puzzle. Yeah, uh, with a series of questions. And the way I look at it is, you know, there is an opportunity um, to solve this puzzle. Um, and once you solve it, uh, you know, in a way you have kind of a win. Now that win will be different for each company, each product in terms of its scale, in terms of the way in which you win. For some winning might be simply surviving and you know, coming back up uh, in a few months. For others, it might actually create net new revenue opportunities. It might actually create growth. Um, and others may have sort of a mixed bag, but uh, you know, let's let's start looking at it. You know, what is this puzzle that we need to solve for success? Um, so, you know, as if if you ever uh, worked on a jigsaw puzzle, which I'm sure you have, if not now, at least in your younger days, is you typically start with a corner piece, right? And for any business, especially the tech business that corner piece is your customers right uh, because customers are affected their business is affected their ways of doing business are affected and their priorities are shifted right so this is an important time uh, a very good time to get closer to your customer not physically but of course in terms of understanding you know how are things changing what is the shift in priorities what is the new normal right uh, and also for some companies, some tools, this might also create opportunities which go beyond their existing target customer base, right? Which means let's say today you are targeting as an example, uh, some kind of travel and tourism industry, right? Let's say you're providing analytics or some kind of software solutions for tourism hospitality. Now, you know that that industry is gonna be affected in a big way. Uh, and one way to deal with that is to kind of wait for that to recover, uh, continue to have the same solution, but just wait for that industry to recover. Another possibility might be to look at, hey, you know, is there my, uh, does my underlying tooling actually allow me to be relevant or useful to another vertical, completely another target segment? Now, that's a sort of radical example. Uh, won't apply to every possible tool or solution but this is something also worth considering if the industry or the group of industries that you are targeting are radically affected it might even be worthwhile not just to look at the priorities of that vertical or that segment but also to look at if there are other segments which have actually become more relevant or more interesting uh, in this current situation uh, in the middle, I've also marked a piece as the VI piece or the very important piece. Uh, just to point out that, hey, you know, there is something else that we'll be talking about. Um, so let's now look at the next piece of the puzzle, right? The first is target customers. And the next one is, of course, uh, your overall business strategy. So a lot of it is going to be dependent on what verticals you're targeting, uh, what was your existing tool, how much capital you have. Whether or not you need to cut costs, whether you can be afford to be aggressive, uh, you know, what your leaders, board, investors are saying. Now, this is very important because, you know, if you are building a product or creating a tech solution or figuring out ways in which to refactor it or re-energize it, it's very important that you have the support of all your stakeholders, right? That means 
you should have defined or there should be somebody else defining for you the overall business strategy which like it or not is going to be a function of uh, capital and access to capital um, and then also how that industry or tech sector is overall affected as well as your target customers but this is important um, and i sort of think of this as the other corner piece that means while the first corner piece is your target customers the other is your access to capital and overall business strategy um, let's look at the third piece okay so the third piece again another corner piece is the product right now i want to spend some time here uh, as this is kind of the focus of our discussion and i look at it in sort of two broad ways one is that you know whatever your product or tool is you know is it relevant in its current form yeah. so lot of tools in their current form or the use cases that were the lead use cases for products may no longer be relevant uh, and that might be a short term so for instance let's say look at tools which are increasing uh, traffic to the stores right so physical footfall traffic to the stores any kind of things that were on display is anything that did with marketing anything that had to do with promotions that pulled more people into the store you know across restaurants across hotels across all these sectors uh, may not be immediately relevant uh, maybe it becomes relevant 3 months 6 months 9 months down the line but right now it's not relevant which means if you lead with that use case nobody will want to have a conversation with you right because nobody is looking to buy solutions which increase foot traffic because it's just not happening right now now this means there is a shift in priority your product could still be relevant but either it has you know the so called soap sanitizer capability that means things which are relevant and timely uh, and that could be achieved by either building something new or it could be achieved by repositioning something uh, go next please okay so you know i've been on this quite a bit uh, and i've had now a series of conversations uh, some with companies that i work with uh, some with others in the industry uh, to talk about you know hey what is actually taking off what is relevant what is of interest to customers where you could still be initiating buying cycles so you know the obvious ones are of course anything to do with video conferencing and collab because that's seen as an alternative travel any kind of physical movement is under restriction so anything that allows you to actually do meetings teaching medicine remotely uh, is of course in and then all tech and tooling which enables that is of also of importance i've seen a variety of use cases in analytics and you know this is not a complete list this is just sort of the slice of the world that i have looked at um, and my expectation is that there are a lot more of these out there uh waiting to be identified uh, for instance you know this is very interesting so a lot of companies used video processing uh, to check you know who's coming in either do demographic analysis uh, analyze traffic traffic violations now none of those use cases are relevant because you have no traffic you have very few people coming into the store but maybe other use cases in that sector are becoming more important. are people observing distance are they wearing masks you know how do you monitor all that how do you monitor whether people are actually keeping distance in manufacturing in the warehouse things like that so a lot of interesting sort of new twists but why why point these out is because these tools have all, always existed the underlying technology doesn't really change but just the use case priorities have shifted so a lot of times an existing tool or a solution could be repositioned or could be marketed and messaged in a way that allows you to actually have some traction and interest from customers and similar use cases are there in auctioning and sales a lot of retailers look to unload their inventory find new ways to actually manage their inventory because they don't want to have a stock that they can't sell so a lot of interesting use cases uh, are coming up where you will still have conversation starting right while most of the conversations are stopped or delayed there is still an opportunity to initiate new conversations in use cases in products in features and capabilities which are seen as timely and relevant so that's the whole idea here in terms of just sharing with you a sample of use cases 
where net new sales cycles or discussions are actually happening even today in spite of so much uncertainty because it's timely and relevant go next please okay so you know of course uh, the other uh, corner piece is marketing um, because you know a lot of times your current channels may not work right so let's say as an example uh, i've talked with a company which was getting most of their leads from uh, doing events right physical events trade shows and so on now that channel is completely closed right it's unclear when if any trade conferences and shows will happen uh, in all likelihood we won't have any significant large gathering for at least 12 months uh, maybe more depending on whose forecast or prediction you want to believe so now that entire channel is shut off right but that doesn't mean all channels are stopped you know of course people are paying a lot more attention to their emails any kind of activity on social media so new channels or alternative channels might open up or the emphasis on the channels through which you market will shift right now most of the digital marketing and digital connecting channels are actually typically a lot cheaper um so if you are able to ride some of those or make use of those some of those channels you might still be able to continue to market you might still be able to reach people uh, possibly even people whom you were not able to reach earlier uh, because essentially now there is no difference uh, in terms of physical distance or the ability to knock on somebody's door or to meet someone at a trade show whether you are based here in india or whether you are based in the us or the middle east or southeast asia everybody is effectively at the same distance which means you are a phone call or a video call away or a social media post or a linkedin in mail away um, so this is something to consider um, and then of course uh, like we talked about earlier you know there is also an opportunity to uh, possibly change alter your positioning uh, and messaging and then of course this needs to be in tune with the target industries uh, either those are the same or they have changed and then of course uh, any kind of role specific messaging that means within our target industry you know uh, what buying center or what level what role are you targeting and what kind of messaging you should give to them um, so go next please so you know this is just a simple example uh, so you know if you live in india and you're likely if you are in a state which still allowing food delivery uh, then this is a snapshot of uh, an app uh, zomato i think uh, in which uh, there is a typical sandwich wrap place uh, and they've launched uh, something which is called immunity booster meals right so this is very interesting now that everybody is worried about the virus and the infection one of the ways in which people want to combat that is by boosting their immunity and they've actually classified and it sort of called some of their meals as immunity booster meals and in that you know you have the same things that they were always selling which is uh, chole kulcha palak paneer and so on but look at this right this is very interesting because it's the same offering right? the product has not changed they were always doing chole kulcha or chole paratha and something like that but now they are calling it immunity booster meals and they are putting it right at the top under their summer specials drawing attention to that why i like this is because you know the offering is the same the product is the same the solution hasn't changed but it's just now a new messaging to craft it uh, new crafted messaging just to make it relevant to what's happening and i see that there is an opportunity to do something similar actually across all products not just the food service but even possibly across tech products and features uh, if not all at least some capabilities yeah go next please okay so of course uh, you know as as similar to what we are talking about marketing um, sales is also affected in a big way in fact you have a lot of sales experts talking about it a lot of opinions a lot of commentary about this but you know in a nutshell it's the same similar series of questions is you know do my current channels still work right the way in which i was selling you know is that still viable uh, in many cases if it was if it involved physical movement it's not a uh, lot of people selling smaller solutions smaller value ticket items may not be affected much because they were likely still selling on the internet and the phone or through social media so they may not get affected but larger solutions might get affected uh, but 
one sort of twist to this which i see is that now uh, you might be able to do without local presence right so a lot of companies in india wonder you know can i sell outside of india how do i sell outside of india how do i sell to the us how do i sell to the middle east you know all these things are seen as challenges but in the current environment in fact you know you are at no disadvantage compared to somebody sitting in new york because that person approaching somebody in california or even across the uh, river is actually still communicating via email and phone you do have a time zone challenge so there is still an opportunity uh, to look at this in a different way which is hey now that distance doesn't matter does that mean i can now potentially start approaching companies outside of india uh, because now in a way it sort of level the playing field um, that's worth considering another sort of two advice two things i have seen one is the average deal size uh, given the uncertainty you know most people are a little reluctant to make large budget commitments uh, so there is definitely not necessarily just price pressure uh, but pressure on potentially having smaller deal sizes um, so maybe there is an opportunity to reimagine if you are selling things which are high value high priced items it might be worth considering whether that should be refactored and you could have a new pricing and positioning statement uh, which might enable your sales um, another uh, channel which i think will now come into greater play uh, offering greater value is partnerships right so if you are a small to mid sized company or a startup um, it's going to be a little harder for you uh, to get attention from your customers in some cases um, you know because while you are figuring out your operations you're going out your product strategy how you can get through the next few months um, you will have a lot on your plate but some of the larger players might be actually better positioned right so this is an opportunity to explore or double down on your investment in partnerships especially with bigger and stronger partners uh, which could be sis which could be tech players which could be cloud players uh, any and all of those uh, to see if those could help actually um, you know help you get new business and sell yeah thanks uh, sorry just one slide back on execution please one slide before this yeah okay thanks so the the earlier piece which was marked the vi piece is of course execution uh, so you know of course there are a lot of ideas strategy product capabilities um, you know expert opinions uh, none of that is worth anything if you are not able to execute and these times are particularly challenging for execution because the situation is dynamic so in a way what it means is that you need to be repeatedly looking at your strategy looking at your product looking at the way you are reaching out to people and uh, see if it still work if not make modifications you know seek expertise seek help from people who've seen this done that you know talk to your coaches mentors investors but sort of keep looking at it in terms of all these different pieces see how well you are able to if you are not able to how can you get help you know can you get help through a partner can you get help through a friend can you get help through a partner that you have in a different geography you know look at that um, keep focused on what you need to achieve um, see how you can manage that execution and ever so often look at how that execution is actually working take stock make modifications yeah go next please so you know in a way i filled out a good chunk of the puzzle uh, but intentionally there are some pieces missing and the pieces are missing because i want to draw attention to the idea that hey you know this is not everything there are a lot of things which are specific to your company or product you know especially let's say the verticals that you are targeting you know what is happening with that vertical uh, regulations you know what kind of regulations come up what kind of uh, policies are adopted by the target governments either where you are doing business where you are selling uh, where you need to be actually where your suppliers might exist you know all kinds of things like that are actually going to be also important in figuring out what that specific path is for you um, so you know the one formula or even the framework will not automatically apply uh, but the larger structure still makes sense 
but still needs to be figured out what is specific to your situation to your product and that will allow you to then uh, help navigate this okay next one please okay so uh, thank you uh, thank you for joining and listening uh, you can reach out to me on linkedin or on my email below and uh, with that i will pause here and uh, ankita uh, please uh, share the questions sure sure thank you costum for this great presentation now we are beginning our q and a session the first question is by rohit he's asking what is the new normal for your organization how have you changed your strategy what use cases have taken a back seat and what use cases are you pursuing on priority okay uh, excellent question uh, so mine is a very small consulting organization uh, so of course uh, initially there was a lot of uncertainty in terms of you know uh, which companies will want to continue uh, while they were still figuring out their own business continuity operations things like that but what has changed since then is uh, you know now everybody actually wants to figure out right so in a way uh, this is why i started you know sort of i had planned a session and then i changed that because this is actually now becoming the most relevant to people which is how do i navigate this uh, so a lot of new conversations and discussions are now going on in terms of having uh, meetings or workshops uh, to figure out hey you know how do i modify my product strategy how do i change my marketing how do i reposition my products uh, so in that sense there has been a new uptick uh, and the third thing which i changed uh, which is of course all the remote working is lot of activity which was happening through travel and on site work has actually been modified and now a lot of that is happening remotely so those are sort of the two or three changes which i see uh, the focus in terms of sort of growing business has reduced now it's more about survival and possibly in some cases finding new use cases and strategy and the remote working has come into a big play yeah thank you thanks costa for the answer uh, abhishek has a question for you He's asking how innovation could prove to be a game changer while defining the product strategy, irrespective on any specific industry. Okay, very interesting question. You know, how can innovation play a role? Um, see, a lot of that. The way I look at it is, if you have an innovative idea or solution, a uh, lot of the same thing applies, right? Which means, is this still now relevant uh, in the new situation? Um, are there any customers for it uh, in some cases you know your product idea or innovation will be relevant and will continue to be relevant but in other cases in a way it might get put on hold which means nobody wants to actually buy or use it right now because they are occupied with other things but you know either you wait it out and then you see how that still continues to play out that's one possibility the other possibility is to see if that innovation has other applications right other ways to position it and this is what i am seeing lot of companies and startups uh, that i am talking to are actually trying to figure out ways in which they can reposition existing solutions right so the lot of the core tech innovation or solution remains the same but in order to make it relevant and timely um, they are looking at ways in which they can um, change the way it's positioned that's one way the second thing is of course uh, going out and hunting for new use cases right? so for instance earlier i talked about that example of video analytics or i talked about the drone thing where it's being now used almost in every locality the so called hotspots to actually do monitoring i mean that would have been unheard of uh, several months ago because it's a gross violation of privacy right having drones go around on the street while you are walking drones in your window i mean we would not have imagined that a few months ago but that is happening now so in fact i see lot lot of drone companies actually getting a lot of uptick lot of new inquiries lot of governments actually deploying drones so that's just an example but you know there are several innovations which either might find faster adoption might have a shift in priorities in their use cases or might actually be able to gain traction uh, simply by repositioning thank you 
Thanks, Kostov, for the answer. Bhagya Rekha has a question for you. Change in strategy needs skill building or cultural changes. How do you think we can achieve that? Wow, that's a great question. How do you achieve uh, skill building and cultural change? Uh, I think like with any of the skill building or cultural change, uh, you know, uh, it takes time. Uh, but of course, in a crisis like situation that we have right now, uh, people are far more open to change, right? Uh, which means in a way, any kind of cultural change, if it's driven in a manner um, such that it's seen as an enabler, both for the people and for the company, it is an advantage, which means uh, people will be more open to changing. Uh, people will be more open to learning. Um, and of course, I see a lot of companies, a lot of people, you know, um, actually spending this time um, to actually pick up new skills, right? So a lot of organizations are actually organizing, you know, sort of fresh uh, uh, learning sessions, you know, where they are actually opening up their own internal training sessions for others so everybody can learn. Uh, they are actually encouraging their employees to gain new skills. So in a way, you have more time. Uh, you have more people open to the idea of learning new things, relearning or changing. So I see this as a great opportunity uh, to do the things that you're talking about, which is skill building um, as well as cultural change, uh, because effectively the hand is forced, right? So instead of looking at it as something hey you know i i don't want to change everybody is uh, likely far more open to the idea that they have to change because all aspects of life has changed for most people yeah thank you thanks costa for the great answer the next question is by sehej any tips for apparel industry based early stage ventures we can help them go digital but if the industry itself takes a lot of time to pick up with us consumer buying lesser apparels what good will going digital do okay excellent question uh, so of course uh, you know the specific answer will depend on your solution and exact target market but in broad strokes, what I can say is, let's say the apparel industry, of course, people are not buying, right? But uh, two things I would point out. One is that the kind of lockdown that we have in India, the lockdown in places like US and Europe is very different. That means a lot of e-commerce deliveries are actually still working. So people are still able to buy apparel. Uh, but maybe the kind of assortment that they would target would be different, right? So maybe I'm not looking to buy jackets and suits and ties if i'm actually no longer heading out uh, but maybe i'm looking to more buy you know business casual wear or comfort wear or lounge wear while i'm sitting at home um, so apparel is still happening uh, yes of course it's on a decline uh, in terms of the overall numbers so i see that and then i also earlier talked about the opportunity where you know i've had very uh, interesting conversations with experts in that domain uh, where we talked about how apparel manufacturer, you know, sellers will now look at ways to manage their inventory in a very different manner, right? Because typically they would acquire their inventory three, six months in advance uh, and lock in that money. Uh, and now most of that inventory they will have to offload, uh, likely through e-commerce sales and auctions. Uh, so they, they will be looking at new ways in which to manage that entire process. So again, I would say, you know, uh, go back to the drawing board, look at what your customers are saying, what's your specific product or solution, see if it still fits in. If it doesn't fit in or needs to be repositioned, that's one way. And also seek out if there are new use cases or possibilities popping up uh, from your existing customers. Thank you. Thanks, Kostub. Arunava has a question. Uh, what should be the startup strategy that is rushing with time to go market MVP? Okay, very good question. Uh, so, you know, if you're a startup uh, rushing towards MVP in terms of going to market, uh, I think you are no different uh, than any other product. I think you will need to take a quick pause, evaluate whether your product, your go to market, uh, the segment that you are targeting, uh, the way in which you are hoping to reach out to customers, 
you know is that still relevant is the solution that you are planning to offer still a priority right because maybe you're rushing to sell it but there is no active market for it right because that use case or solution has been put on hold right which could happen right like earlier i talked about some of the uh, solutions which are trying to bring more people to the door right in all kinds of industry now all those solutions are no longer relevant right now that doesn't mean they will be forever irrelevant they might be relevant three six months nine months down the line um, so i would take a pause i would look at evaluate the target market the problem uh, the way in which you are hoping to reach out to your potential customers and prospects the way in which you are hoping to validate uh, your mvp you know take a close look at that see if it's still relevant if it's all relevant timely and people still want to buy you know maybe no change but i see that as a low likelihood possibility the more likelihood possibility is that some or all these pieces will need to be reevaluated and possibly modified uh, so take a closer look at each of the each of those pieces of the puzzle um, see if it still makes sense thank you and cost it. so uh, now it is 3:30 but in the middle due to the technical problem we had somewhat you know uh, wasted 5 minutes so let's just compensate that and let's have two more questions quickly uh, sure. the other question by sure sure cost it, by bala krishna how can we use the ai automation robotics and drone technology to help in work from home excellent question uh, i wish i had a quick answer for it uh but you know because that's a lot of pieces that's ai uh, and then there is robotics and then there are drones uh, let me just take the first part in the interest of time uh, in terms of ai or sort of broadly think of automation right um, so i i've come across now examples across multiple use cases where if not ai automation is helping maybe to some extent uh, you know some slice of ai is helping uh i'll talk about two use cases so one is let's say your call centers right so a lot of problem solving uh, either within a company where let's say people are having hr issues or accounting issues expense filing issues a lot of that uh, was typically happening through phones or in case a lot of people are co-located that was happening by people walking across to a different floor meeting a, your hr person accounting person and so on so now that entire workflow is affected so none of that can happen in a physical movement manner but a lot of that now requires automation right so companies who are already on systems uh, digitized systems now need to find some assembly of these workflows which can be automated uh, both are simplified in terms of people getting access to information uh, which you know at the simplistic end of it could be a chatbot or an assistant because you simply don't have as many people available or you don't have as many people physically present uh, in your office um, that's a great area for automation uh, another area which we already seeing some solutions float up is in dealing with customer queries and complaints right so now that this entire call center stuff is affected if you are actually dealing and supporting external customers whether it's to do with tickets complaints or doing more complex things all those workflows are affected right if any of you had that had to go through the trouble to cancel an airfare or change your travel plans when the lockdown was initiated with barely 24 or 48 hour notice you would have realized that you know neither the airlines nor the online travel agencies were able to keep up with it because you know of course their call call volume had doubled tripled or more and they were simply not able to deal with it. So while that huge uh, sort of uptick in volume will not be there forever, uh, this has highlighted the situation where a lot of the simpler problems uh, could have been solved uh, through some kind of automation or a chatbot or some kind of a virtual assistant which would have dealt with these things, right? So, at least on the AI side of things, the simplistic use cases, I see a lot of interest in enabling automation like this. Uh, you know, whether it's through providing assistance to staff or enabling their collaboration and workflows, or it's providing assistance to
Hi, Kostup. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, Kostup. Can you hear me? Kostrup, can you hear me? Hi, Kostrup, can you hear me? Yeah. Something going on with the muting, unmuting. I can hear you. Go ahead. Please uh, tell me your question. All right, all right. So I think uh, just one minute left. Last question by Shekhar Rao. Yeah. Just two seconds answer, Kostum. Do you think sure. digital transformation, uh, he's also complimenting great talk, Kostum. Question okay. is, do you think digital transformation will take a leap adoption post three to six months and that will bring in new opportunities in new normal? How can companies co-create with client to understand this deeper and adopt their products slash solutions? Okay, uh, great question, Jacob. Uh, yes, I think a lot of people believe that digital transformation might get accelerated. Uh, though I have a slightly nuanced view on that. I think again, as with any effort such as digital transformation or marketing or enabling any kind of workflows, uh, I would take a closer look at the specific use cases, right? Because digital transformation like AI or robotics is uh, fairly big umbrella term. I would look at the specific use cases uh, in the vertical uh, or the segment that you are targeting. See if any kind of workflow change automation changes uh, are actually occurring in terms of what's happening internally within the customer or what's happening at the touch points uh, for that company with its customers and partners. Right, Similar to some of the call center use cases that we talked about. Now if those use cases are actually materially changing in terms of priority. Uh, like uh, we had this example where we are saying that, hey, you know, now nobody can go across the street for help. So everybody is calling and connecting digitally. Now, in a situation like that, uh, you know, enabling those workflows will suddenly become priority. Um, and that's just an example. So similarly, take a look at which use cases are bubbling up in terms of priority. Are new use cases coming about in that specific target and see if you can you know initially while you know to the second part of your question is how do we co-create is listen to your customers right uh, i think this is not the time to immediately start selling uh, you can of course sell but listen first in terms of seeing how uh, you know what what are their issues and concerns right uh, what is the shift in priority and then uh, sort of recraft your positioning uh, or your solution to say hey this is the part that I can enable, right? And I think if you do that with two or three different customers in your segment, you know, within India, internationally, or across the globe. Can you just go to the recording? Yeah, yeah, Can Costa, uh, can you hear me? All right, I think uh, there is some issue with connectivity from Costa's side. So uh, thank you every, thank you very much, everyone, for coming and listening to this great session. I'm sure you must have uh, learned something new. This was a great and interesting session. Uh, tomorrow, I will again meet you all of you at four o'clock with an interesting and amazing session. The topic will be artificial intelligence and undying hope. To register, please visit nascom.in slash events. Thank you, Kostov, if you're able to hear me for this great session. Thank you for your time and efforts. And thank you, everyone, for coming and attending the session. See you tomorrow at 4. Thank you, all of you.
to me on email or LinkedIn. Thank you. Bye. All right, bye. Bye, Costa.